Hi folks, I'm Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA and one of the most common questions I get from my new tax clients is, hey, how do I reduce my taxable income so I can reduce my tax liability, also known as what kind of expenses are deductible through my business? So in this video, I'll attempt to answer that question even without the context of understanding the type of business that you're in and how to generate income which is really the most important part before being able to give the answer of what's deductible or giving you a laundry list of the things that you could deduct from the business. So as you watch this video, you will understand the context in which the tax law is written. Section 162A of the tax code specifically talks about trade or business deductions. And it basically says, and this is paraphrase, is all the expenses that are ordinary, necessary, legal, reasonable, and paid or incurred while carrying on a trader business are essentially deductible. Now, this is great news. This means that everything is potentially deductible. But we're going to be talking about what this means in detail, and then you'll be able to apply this test into any of your expenses to the point that you really don't need to consult an accountant for every single thing. Some things you might need a professional for, but generally speaking, you should be able, as a business owner, to know what type of expenses fall under these categories. So what we're going to be talking about in this video is essentially five things. One, let's describe what a trade or business income means. Then let's briefly touch base about non-business tax deductions. We'll talk about those briefly because that's not the context of this video. We'll be talking about what expenses reduce my business income. So specifically, we'll talk about those five elements that the expense itself will need to have. Then we'll talk about some, more, some of the common business tax deductions. This falls uh, under most businesses and not necessarily all of them, but you will hear about them and I'll briefly go through them so you'll have an idea of what that is. And non-deductible items or the typical non-deductible things that people tend to think is deductible. So let's start with what is a trade or business income. So within this context, this could be income that is produced via the ordinary operation of a legal entity like an LLC or a corporation. But it could also be income earned by an individual that's acting as an independent contractor. He gets paid uh, via a business and maybe they file the 1099 form to the IRS and your, your ordinary income is coming in reported as a 1099 form. In many cases, you don't even get that income reported, especially if you sort of run your own business, not a legal entity, but you sort of run your sole proprietorship. Now, you can also generate income on your own from the sales of products or services, maybe online or in person, and generally any non-investment income that you're not already getting in a W-2 by your employer. So any income that falls into that category, it's probably business income or trade or business income, and the deductions that we'll be talking about will be applying to those and those only. Now, let's talk about non-business deductions. Again, we're not covering non-business in this video, so that's within the scope of the video. But generally, the concept of deductions, it's against income, and it's only valid, again, within the context of business income. Check the description below. I'll have some links and maybe other videos where I talk about non-business deductions, which are really limited uh, not really that much to talk about there, but uh, but this video will be focused on business 100%. So what expenses are deductible uh, for my business? So if we actually go to section 162A of the IRS tax code, you're going to see sprinkled throughout the code and the codification of the tax law, you're going to see these key words, and I'm going to explain them to you in detail. Ordinary and necessary. That's a really important one, probably the most important one. Second, reasonable. So the IRS actually doesn't do a really good job explaining reasonable. This is actually a bit more subjective. Keep in mind that IRS auditors are people and they're going to be applying their own sort of common sense and reasonable standards uh, to them during an audit. Now, they have to be paid or incurred in carrying on a trade or business during the tax year where the income was produced and they have to be legal. So let's deep dive into those. Let's start with ordinary and necessary. So first of all, the expense should be routine or directly re related to the business activities. So it needs to be understood that that type of business normally makes 
those type of expenditures. Remember, the IRS has tons of data of 100 million businesses or 100 million taxpayers, I meant to say, um, about their income and business income. So based on their type of business and, and the classification, they can run tons of statistics to know what ordinary is or what is the norm. So that's typically what that means. That's what ordinary means. Now, necessary typically means that it's appropriate and helpful in developing the taxpayer's business. There also needs to be a sufficient connection between the expenditure and the production or generation of income. In other words, you have to prove that the expenditure was necessary in order to produce the income. Now, they cannot be inherently personal in nature. So you can make the case that, hey, I'm a I'm a single father and I have to put my kids in daycare in order for me to go out there and generate income. You can make the connection that putting the kids in daycare allows you to generate the income, but it's not ordinary, nothing to do with the business itself. It is necessary, but it's inherently personal in nature. Therefore, it wouldn't be deductible. So that's kind of how the law, how the tax law gets applied. Now, it could also be used to build or maintain the reputation of the trade or business. So if you're making the expenditure to build a a brand or reputation or maintain the reputation of that trade or business, that's good. If it's for the personal, for the for the individual, it's not. So a typical example is some of my uh, clients tell me, hey, listen, I get a pedicure, I get a haircut, I get a nice expensive suit. That way when I show up into my customers, they trust me or they're more likely to do business with me. So you could make that connection and start connecting how those things actually allow you to produce uh, income, but that is inherently personal in nature. That's exactly what that means. And it's also used to build or maintain reputation of the individual, not the business itself. That's exactly what that law is meant to say. Now, also, it must not be a startup or a pre-business expense. So these are expenditures having to do with while the business is already carrying on. Now, before the business is started, you can accumulate those expenses and there's different mechanisms to expense some of them and expense them through the life of the business. Also similar to capital expenditures. We're gonna deep dive into that a little bit later on. So what what is reasonable? Uh, So difficult to explain. This is a very subjective concept. So the best way to explain is it's not unreasonable. And I think maybe using lavish or extravagant to describe what unreasonable means could probably be the best way to explain it. So let's say, for example, I'm in the pizza delivery business and uh, and I buy a vehicle to deliver pizzas. That's going to be totally fine. But if I buy a Ferrari to deliver a business, that would be unreasonable. Again, very subjective. It's based on what the judges uh, in, in, in tax court would say or the auditor that you're dealing with would say. So this is 100% subjective and you do need to apply tons of professional judgment as an accountant to give customers uh, advice about what reasonable means. And as a business owner, you also must think, look, would you sit in front of a judge and make an argument that's totally unreasonable defending that particular expenditure? If you wouldn't do that, if you wouldn't under oath sit there and make a total unreasonable claim about an expenditure being deductible, if you feel in your gut that you wouldn't do that, then it is unreasonable. That's probably the best way to explain it. Now, what does paid or incurred mean? In other words, look, during the tax year, what you uh, what you generated the income, you made the expenditure. You used the credit card to pay for it. You pay for it in cash. You pay for it with a check. Typically, you will match it. So if you generate the income in 20, 20, 2019 and you have the expenditure that you made during 2019, those things should match. And that expenditure should match the generation of the income. In some cases, and this gets complicated with accrual-based accounting, you can make the expenditure the year before to generate income in the future years, such as marketing or advertising. And we'll talk about the specific examples a little bit later on. But it needs to be connected to that activity uh, during the tax year or during the time that generated the income. And paid or incur also means that you have the burden of proof. You must prove that you pay for it. So you have to keep documentation, keep receipts, invoices, uh, paid checks, uh, cash logs, whatever, bank statements, whatever it is that you use to keep track or prove that you actually made that expenditure 
or you incurred that expenditure, that's going to be required under uh, that require under that requirement. The last one is legal, and also we can describe legal by not illegal. So the taxpayer must be in the legal capacity to generate the income and should also be in the legal capacity to make that expenditure. So for example, if I am an unlicensed doctor and I'm generating income from medical consultations or whatever, generally any expenses that I try to claim against that would not be deductible. Although the income would be taxable, the expenses wouldn't be deductible because I don't have the legal capacity to perform that work. At the same time, if the expenditure itself is illegal in nature, and they specifically talk about bribes, right, government official bribes and that sort of thing, that's not going to be deductible uh, at all. So if the expenditure itself, the activity of the expenditure, it's illegal, or the income generated activity, it's illegal, that expense might not be deductible because it won't fall into this condition of legal. Now, in conclusion, what is deductible for my business then? Well, there's the answer. All legal, reasonable, ordinary, and necessary expenses paid or incurred during the tax year while carrying on a trade or business are deductible. So you apply this rule and you can pretty much make a decision on your own on everything that you spend, whether or not it's deductible for the business. Now let's do a couple of examples and there's potentially hundreds and thousands of expenditures you can potentially have for your business. There's a specific book I'm going to recommend. I'll put the link in the description below called 475 Tax Deductions. It's a really short book, easy to read. If you go through it, it'll give you a general idea of what are the common things that most business owners deduct from the business. And there's 475 items are described in that book. But in this video, I'll, I'll talk about 15. Let's talk, let's, man, let's, let's call them the top 15. So let's start with the first one, your office expense or a home office expense. So if you physically have an office, you're renting the office, you're equipping that office, that's going to be deductible. If you have dedicated space in your house, dedicated, isolated space, that's only for business purposes, and you're not using it for personal purposes as well, you can deduct that by taking the percentage of the square footage. The mechanics of the calculation are a bit complex, but typically we take a percentage of the home's, the home's overall expenditure dedicated to the office space, and that's how we make the calculation. There's also some safe harbor rules that allow you just to take the square footage of that space, multiply it times $5, limit it to 300 square feet. So any, any taxpayer that doesn't keep any records about a home office, but can prove that it had 300 square feet in their home dedicated to office space, multiply it times $5, you get $1,500 deduction right off the bat for any business income. Now, business vehicle, if you buy a vehicle for the business under the business name, that is, a bus that, that is business in nature, not personal in nature, the entire expenditure of that vehicle, the gas, the insurance, all that stuff will be deductible. If you use a personal vehicle for business purposes, then you have to keep a mileage log, and typically it's best just to multiply the total number of business miles times whatever the annual, uh, the, the tax rate, the, the mileage reimbursable rate of that year is, which currently for 2020, is going to be 58 cents. Now, liability insurance. If you get insurance to protect that trade or business, general liability type of insurance, workers' compensation for your employees, that is going to be deductible. Actual life insurance to the business owner will not. So if you get life insurance, that's not deductible at all. Disability insurance for the business owner, where the where, again, where the benefactor is the business owner or the business owner's family, that will not be deductible. And health insurance is a little bit tricky. So most self-employed individuals can deduct their health insurance. However, the specific mechanisms, especially if you have an S corporation, where you actually have to include the cost of the health insurance in the W-2. Now, there won't be any duplication of income. You actually will get a deduction for that, but the mechanics of how it's put together gets a little bit tricky with S corporations. Long story short, if, you're, if you run a business, and you're a business owner, and you pay health insurance for yourself as the owner or yourself as the, an employee of the business as well, that will be deductible. Now, business meals, this gets a little bit tricky. Now, most people think that in 2019 and beyond, business meals are not deductible anymore. That's not the case. 
business meals are still 50% deductible, but entertainment is not. So if you take a client out to eat and you conduct business while eating, if you talk about business while eating, you're fine, you're in the clear. But if you entertain a client in a concert or a football game where you couldn't really make the case that you're conducting business or talking about business while there's a lot of noise, maybe there's a lot of alcohol involved, then it's not going to be deductible. So it's really the entertainment portion that can cancel out the business meal portion. So when you are documenting your business meals, make sure that it is for meals you're you're having with a partner, with a business owner, sorry, with a with an employee or with a customer, and you are conducting and talking about business, working while eating, basically. Number six, travel. So if you're traveling for business, traveling to the job site, traveling to the client's office, traveling to a trade conference where you're gonna learn about the business, meet potential partners, meet other vendors, that is going to be deductible. Where most business owners fail here is that they mix personal travel with business travel, and then basically the IRS will deem that to be a personal expense or personal in nature, and then it wouldn't be deductible anymore. So if you want to deduct your travel, make sure that you have documented the specific place that you went to, how that pertains to your business, where the connection is, the type of clients that you met with, the type of vendors that you met with, with the type of business you conducted afterwards. Remember, all audits are two, three years in arrear. So you can't make the case that you went to the Bahamas for business and then did absolutely no business with anyone in the Bahamas afterwards. So you have to keep that in mind when trying to deduct uh, travel expenses. Now, contract labor, if you pay a person to help you run your business, to help you do some work because you couldn't have an employee yet or maybe it's some additional casual labor on top of your employees, that will be deductible, but you have to make sure that you document the contract labor cost by giving that contractor a 1099 form. This is a really important part of it. Now, cost of goods sold, so any expenditures you make for products that you're selling or reselling as a business that sells product, that's obviously all going to be deductible. So as long as you sell that product, any products that you buy, they're going to be deductible under cost of goods sold. It gets a little bit tricky if you're an accrual-based uh, business owner and you track inventory, not all the purchases will be deductible. Only the portion of the purchases for the products that were sold will be deductible. So then you got to talk to your accountant about accrual-based accounting and inventory uh, because that could affect that number. But just know, absolutely, cost of goods sold will be deductible. Now, marketing and advertising, if, if any expenditure that you make in order to increase the brand and reputation of your business, marketing it, advertising for it, that is going to be uh, deductible. Now, office tools and office supplies. So any tools that you that you buy that you need to do, do your job, to do the administrative portion of running your business and office supplies, that's all going to be deductible. Now, employee and employee benefits. So if you hire an employee, you run it through payroll, all the payroll taxes, all the salaries, and any benefits you pay for that employee, that's all going to be uh, deductible. Legal or professional fees. So if you hire a lawyer, an accountant, a business consultant to help you run your business, help you structure your business, that is going to be deductible. There are some exceptions to the rule when you're doing all these things pre-business. Some of these things could be startup expenses. So you might want to consult with your CPA to differentiate what is a startup expense from an ongoing expense while the business is active. Now, office rental or equipment rental. So if you rent a printer, a copier for your office, you rent a, or lease a computer, you lease some office space, absolutely, that's going to be a deductible. Repairs and maintenance, any expenditures you make in order to maintain and repair the tools and the equipment for your business, that's going to be deductible as well. And any bank fees or interest expenses. So if you pay some finance charges to use a credit card or you take out a business loan and you're paying interest against a business loan, uh, that would be deductible. Obviously, all personal loans uh, wouldn't be deductible through the business. There might be through the personal if it's a mortgage or something like that, but generally speaking, uh, it has to be a business loan itself. Now, what about charitable expenses? I didn't mention that. That's a very common one. And this one gets a little bit tricky. So generally, if you have a pass-through entity like a sole proprietorship, a, part, a multi-member LLC, a partnership, or an S-corporation, 
charitable expenses are recorded. They're not deductible through the business, and then they're passed through the owner to be used or reported in their personal tax return. Now, the tricky part is that every single business owner could have a different circumstance when it comes to standard deductions or itemized deductions. And in many cases, people using standard deductions, they won't be able to deduct any of the charitable expenses. So the business itself may have paid tons of money to charity, but the business owner might might not be able to take any deductions if they're not itemizing their deductions. So charitable expenses gets tricky when it comes to uh, tax planning. Now, very common question again, what about shareholder distributions or owner draws? So my customers tell me, hey, I took out $1,000 a month to pay myself. Isn't that a deduction through the business because I'm working for the business in lieu of, of an employee? So generally, the answer is if it's a draw or a distribution is not considered a deduction because the actual net income is flowing through the owner and that benefit is flowing through the owner. Uh, one of the exceptions to the rule would be if the business owner is on payroll. So the business owner is on payroll and generating a W-2, that expenditure absolutely would be deductible through the business, but then it's includable in the W-2. So at the end, it's sort of a wash when it comes to tax planning or uh, income reduction. So typically when the owner pays themselves, that's not part of uh, tax planning. I'll put a little pause on that. Most companies should be an S corporation in order to uh, specifically reduce what's called self-employment uh, payroll tax. It's a topic for an entirely different video. Uh, but uh, but paying yourself as a business owner is not necessarily going to reduce your taxes. Now, what about capital expenditures? We talked about that uh, earlier. Major expenses, also called fixed assets, equipment, machinery, vehicles, real estate, that are expensed, uh, they're, they're purchased, but then they're expensed, mechanically, they're expensed through the useful life of the asset. So if you buy a piece of real estate, you might not be able to deduct that real estate for the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, you know, per year, you'll take a little portion of that expenditure or a vehicle for five years or some equipment for seven years. So you don't take the entire cost of that capital expenditure and and deducted that year, you actually deduct it over time. So that's really important. That's called depreciation. Now, typically, the sort of magic number to look at is $2,500. So if you're a small business and you're making a major purchase of $2,500 or more, and that thing that you're buying, that asset you're buying, has a useful life of more than a year, typically you'll be depreciating that and you will only be taking part of the of that expenditure, of that investment, as a deduction the first year and, and consequently part the next years. Now, you might want to ask your accountant about something called Section 179 deduction, which actually allows you to depreciate uh, these capital assets 100% on the year that is purchased. Some uh, assets don't apply, vehicles don't apply, real estate doesn't apply, and there are certain rules and limitations. You might want to ask your CPA about that, but it is possible that a lot of your capital expenditures could be expensed through this mechanism of Section 179 depreciation. So anyway, I hope that this video was useful for you. Um, go ahead and put some comments below. Tell me what type of videos you'd like to see next. This is part of a series where I'm going to go really high level and then deep dive into specific issues having to do with taxation for business owners. If you like this video, make sure you hit like, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell so you get notified when the next video comes out and share it with your friends and family. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on the next one.